We are so pleased you've joined us today for St. Stephen's Online. We're praying for you as you watch this, wherever you're tuning in from. Lord God, be with us as we worship together and listen to today's talk. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty tomb is there to prove my Savior. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just. Because he lives And then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's fight No war with pain And then as death Gives way to victory I'll see the light Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because. face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives Why not open your Bible or click on the link below to read the passage before we hear from our speaker. What a fantastic reading that is from um, Ephesians, uh, from Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16, about maturity, growing to maturity in Christ. Um, I'm really blessed to be part of a growing family. Um, we're growing in numbers. We had a, a new son-in-law a few years ago, now a gr new grandchild, which I'm sorry I keep mentioning, but it's quite important to me. Um, so we're growing in numbers as a family, and we're also growing in maturity. And I see that most um, when, uh, or I feel that most, I think, um, in my own body as I go into my mid-50s. There are bits of me that don't work quite as well as they used to, uh, bits that click. Some of you may have more experience of this than me. But there's a maturing going on um, it, that's part of growing. There's growing in maturity physically, and there's also growing in maturity in Christ. I hope and I pray and I believe that over the years, by God's grace, I have matured in my faith in Christ. Matured in Christ-like character by God's grace. Ha that's happened through the Spirit's work in me. 
I still have a long way to go. But um, uh, I te- and I tell you these things not to boast, but as an illustration to show that families grow in number and families grow in maturity. And that is what the church is called to do. The church, the family of God, the body of Christ is called to grow in number and is called to grow in maturity. And Ephesians 4 and 5 is about the church growing in its maturity in Christ. It's about what it means for a church community to grow up into Christ-likeness, into Christ. And this call to grow in maturity in Christ connects to that incredible description of the church at the end of chapter 3 that I think uh, Archdeacon Richard preached on last week. It's a description of the church's incredible eternal purposes of God through history. A church that expresses the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ died for sinners and was raised from death. A church that expresses the work of God through Jesus in creating community entirely new, creating something new, a new life for individuals and a new society. A church that expresses the reality of the coming kingdom of God in our lives and through the work of the Spirit in us in the life of the church. A church that expresses and offers real hope of real transformation for everyone for eternity. The awful daily news that very sadly provides masses of evidence for humanity's lostness and fallenness breaks our hearts. It's a dark world that we live in. It shows a world that's alienated from God and from God's ways, a world full of fractured humanity, divided by race, divided by gender, divided by fear, divided by sinfulness, divided by anger and revenge. But the church is called to show God's remedy to that. We have been made different by the work of God in us. Nothing that we have done, but by the work of God in us. We're called to express that there is a new possibility of being one family, one new humanity through our unity in Christ. That's what Paul describes at the end of chapter 3. A church as a vehicle to demonstrate the wonderful work of God in Christ in the world and to the heavenly realms, which is extraordinary. He's saying, look what God has done for us. Look what God has done for the world. And you can see it writ large in the church. Look at the hope, the transformation, the joy that knowing God the Father can bring in the face of the darkness of the world. Isn't that stunning? It's the reality that God has created and made possible through Jesus. I don't know about you, But as I look at the church and at my own life, if I'm honest, I confess I don't think we've quite reached that vision yet. That vision of what we are called to be. And that's why Paul goes on from the end of chapter 3 to talk about the church growing in maturity, growing to maturity, growing into Christ. That's why he doesn't stop at the end of chapter 3. That's why he keeps writing in chapters 4, 5, and 6. Like a growing family, we, the church, are called to grow in number and in maturity until, as it says in verse 13, all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So how do we do that? Paul suggests two ways. Unity and holiness. Holiness is for another sermon. Uh, That's his teaching from chapter 4, verse 17 onwards into chapter 5. Today's focus is on unity and what he means by that. The first 16 verses of chapter 4, where Paul calls us to be one, to live in unity in character, unity in God, unity in diversity, all leading to unity through maturity. So let's start where Paul does with our behaviour towards one another. Thanks, Sarah. You can put the first one up on there. Thank you. Unity in character. Verses 2 and 3. All about our behaviour towards one another. This is where he starts. 
the first key in showing maturity is to is in how we relate to each other jesus last command to his disciples in john chapter 15 anybody remember love one another love one another as i have loved you if you go back into john 13 he says a new command i give to you this is jesus love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another that incredible vision of paul's from ephesians 3 we show that to the world by loving one another and paul expands on that at what that means in verses 2 and 3 he urges the church to be completely humble and gentle to be patient bearing with one another in love what does all that mean firstly uh, to be completely humble We see that humility in Jesus who humbled himself. Jesus who set a a little child before people and said, "This this is what you should be like with your father. And the Greek word that Paul uses uh, means a kind of um, lonely, lowliness or humility of mind. It's the humble recognition of the worth and value of other people because they too are valued by God and loved by God. We are called to love one another because God loves each one of us and values each one of us equally. And we are to do the same. Even the people we don't like or we find slightly annoying. I wonder who you instinctively like or who you might instinctively dislike. Have you ever taken time to reflect on that? We all have people like that. Um, Often we instinctively like those we find easy to get on with, I suspect. Those who give us the respect we feel that we deserve. That's how the world works, but that's not how Christ is, nor how we should be. C.S. Lewis writes, beautifully defines humility as not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I love that. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. What would it look like for me and you to respect others as equally valued children of God? And what about the gentleness? The Greek word here was also used for um, domesticated animals. Uh, so that kind of gentleness of, of an oxen or of a donkey. So there's a real strength in that gentleness. It's those whose strength is under control, under the control of Christ. And Paul urges us to be completely humble and gentle with one another. The next pair of words, patience and bearing with one another in love, go together. Patience is about being long-suffering towards people who we might find aggravating. And bearing with is about mutual tolerance, if you like, that enables us to live together in peace. And all of this is encompassed in that word, love. To love one another with complete humility and gentleness, patience and bearing with one another in love. And they come from the Spirit's work in each of us. They are fruits of the Spirit of God, and we need to enable them, to cultivate them, to encourage them to grow through practicing them. Just, um, yeah, this is a risky thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Just take a moment to think um, of somebody who you might find slightly aggravating or annoying, someone who you don't, like, naturally get on with. Don't say their name, just in case they're sat next to you. Just, Just think of someone like that. And now... Pray for them. Pray that God would help each of us to be humble with them, to respect them for their God-given worth, to be gentle and patient and bear with them and love them as Jesus loves us. And imagine what the Church of God, the body of Christ, would look like if we all treated one another like that all the time. Christian unity relies on us behaving in a Christ-like way toward one another. That's the foundation of the next three bits of unity, which we'll move on to um, slightly more quickly. 
Um, the first is uh, um, unity in God, verses 4 to 6. Our Christian unity comes from God. In verses um, uh, 4 to 6, uh, the, there are, sorry, 3 to 6, there are four verses, and Paul uses the word one seven times in that short space, in those short uh, verses. One body, the body of Christ, because we're all given one spirit. No matter what our background, our heritage, our social status, our gender, our age, we are all part of the body of Christ. There is one hope, one faith, one baptism, because there is only one Lord in whom we have faith, through whom we have hope, into whom we are baptised. The body of Christ cannot be divided. We are one. There is one Christian family because we all have the same Heavenly Father. One church because there is only one God. So, you might ask, why is it, why is it that we have so many denominations and so many divisions uh, that seem to be around in the church? Well, um, some commentators would say, and I think I'm with this, that there, it's because there's this thing, this difference between what they call an invisible church and a visible church. The invisible church is the church that God has created, the church that God has made as described in Ephesians 3. The church throughout history, if you like, the, vis the visible church is the church that we see around us, not just here, but the broader church as a whole where our fallenness, where our lack of understanding, where our sinfulness mean that there is division. And Paul knows that too. Because in verse 3, he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Literally, spare no effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, the unity that is given to us by the one God. In other words, grow towards making the invisible visible through how we behave toward one another and follow the leading of the Spirit to be the church that God has called us to be. Let me try an analogy to help with this. Um, I'm a, a, a Liverpool FC fan. Any other Liverpool uh, football club fans here? Two. Excellent. Um, we are in the South East, so most of you Man U supporters, I suspect. Um, the, uh, I, but I don't make it visible generally by wearing the shirt. I very, very, very rarely go to Anfield to watch them play. But yet, I were invisibly, if you like, I'm a Liverpool fan, but I don't make it visible, which means most people would say I'm not a real one. Similar in the church. Invisibly, we are all part of the same body because God has made us so. But visibly, we need to make the effort to wear the shirt. Does that make sense? God has made us one church, called to grow to maturity in Christ. We're to make every effort to maintain that unity, maturing to behave like Christ through the character stuff that we talked about a few minutes ago. That means that when we inevitably disagree with one another, we should seek the unity of the Spirit's leading, not our own preferences or arguments. Yes, we need to have discussions and conversations. We need to talk and pray things through. But in the end, we're, dis we're seeking to discern the will of God and not our will or the will of society. Verse 15 reminds us that as we, as we mature, we learn to speak the truth, God's truth, in love. There's loads more I could say here, but I have time. So that's something about a unity in God. And the third thing is unity in diversity in gifts. Um, we have a unity in our, in our diversity of gifts, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Look around you. Every believer in this room has been given a gift by God, a ministry in the church, in God's church. Every one of us has a calling to use in the, as a member of the body of Christ, every single person. If you are a follower of Jesus, say with me, I am a member of the body of Christ. And if that's true, 
then it's also true that you've been gifted to serve Christ in the world and in the church. Each one of those gifts has been given to us by God. They're not ours, they're God's, and God's given them to us to be used. So what's your gift, and how are you using it at the moment? Because we gain unity by working together, by ministering together. Yes, Paul points out that some are given gifts as prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors and teachers, But note the purpose of those gifts. If you look at verse 12, it says the purpose of those gifts is to prepare God's people for works of service, to prepare God's people for their ministry in the world. Every member ministry. That service could be in the church or it could be outside in the non-church world, in, in our work or in voluntary work. We all have a ministry, a part to play in the church of God. And that changes over time. If you don't know what yours is, I'd encourage you to ask someone else. What do they see in you? And then start using it. The role of the clergy and staff team and others in this church is to prepare God's people to prepare all of us for works of service or ministry. And why is that? Leads on to my final point. So that we grow in maturity. All those are so that we grow in maturity in Christ. So verse 12 of Ephesians 4, if you've got it open, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, may grow in number and may grow in maturity. Read verses 13 to 16 if you want to know more about that. So as I come to a close, we grow to maturity in Christ through loving one another by being one church of our one God, by finding and using our gifts and encouraging one another in them. There is a lot of work and joy to being part of a growing family, and that includes a growing family of the church. And at St Stephen's, we're called to live a life worthy of the incredible calling we have received from God in Christ Jesus to be a growing family, to be growing in numbers, to be growing in maturity. By God's grace, We're gloriously part of the worldwide eternal body of Christ. And we are the body of Christ in this place at this time. What is God saying to you this morning about playing your part in that body, about maintaining that unity? How are you and I growing in maturity? Because when we do that, the whole of the, the church of God matures. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you have made us to be one church with one hope, one faith, one Lord. One church demonstrating your purposes that you accomplish through Christ our Lord. Help us to live lives worthy of that calling. Through your power at work within us, help our personal and our church life to be worthy of the calling to which we have been called. In our interactions with one another, may we be humble, gentle, patient and loving. Forgive us when we fail in that. Help us to forgive one another. Affirm in each of us that we are part of your one church with one Lord who gives us true hope. Encourage us in our diversity of gifts. Help us to know how you're calling each of us to serve so that together we may come to maturity in Christ, growing up into him, speaking the truth in love and holding to your teaching and leading. May we grow and build ourselves up in love as we each do our work for you. Enable us to be a family growing in maturity and growing in number. For we ask this in your name, our one Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to find out more about St Stephen's, please head to our website, Follow us on social media or contact the church office.